The Ghost of Fossil Glen, Chapter 11. After dinner, Allie and her parents unloaded the dust from the car, carried it upstairs to her room, and arranged it against the wall in place of the old plywood and block table. Mrs. Nichols squinted critically at the desk, shifting it slightly to the right, then to the left. Finally, she said, Looks nice right there, don't you think? It's perfect, said Allie. Michael appeared at the door, holding a tablet and a box of crayons. Can I color at your new desk, Allie? he asked. Allie smiled when she saw his serious expression. You have some important work to do, she asked. Michael nodded. Okay, come here, said Allie. She pulled out the chair for him, and Michael sat down and opened his crayon box. Don't you have any homework, now that you have an official desk to do it on? asked her father. Nope, said Allie happily. We don't even have to write in our journals tonight. Mr. Henry collected them today. He's probably reading them right now. Allie glanced up and caught a look pass, passing between her parents. They sat down, Mr. Nichols in the chair opposite Allie's, Mrs. Nichols on the bed. Michael, seated in Allie's new chair, was concentrating on his paper. If you don't have any homework, honey, her mother said gently, would you like to talk about what happened with Karen and Pam? Allie sighed. Not really, she said. It's not always easy for three people to be friends, said Mrs. Nichols. Someone usually ends up feeling left out. Yes, yeah, said Allie, like me. Your mother said they called you a liar, said her father. What was that all about? Allie groaned inwardly. She was going to have to go through the whole thing all over again. Her parents were both looking at her with interest. Serious expressions. She knew they only wanted to help, but she really didn't feel like talking about it. We were talking at lunch about a teacher at school, Mr. Pinckney, and about Miss Gillis Bye and Mrs. Hobbs. She's this really crabby cafeteria lady and trying to figure out how they ended up working at our school. I mean, that's what I thought we were doing, just fooling around and making up theories, she explained as patiently as she could. Her parents sat listening, their eyebrows lifted with interest and concern, waiting for her to say more. When she didn't, her father said, so these theories of yours about Miss Gillis by and the others, were they true? I don't know, said Allie, trying not to sound as exasperated as she felt. Probably not. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We were just speculating, and I was behind, being kind of silly on purpose, trying to imagine, for example, what a guy like Mr. Pinkney is doing teaching Jim. Mr. and, Nichols, Mr. and Mrs. Nichols met with P Mr. Pinkney each year at open house night at school. Allie's father was trying unsuccessfully to hide a grin. I can see how you might wonder, he said. So I was trying to think of possible reasons, Allie went on. I like to try and figure people out. But you were just guessing, said her mother. Well, yeah, answered Allie, of course. And sometimes your theories are so convincing that you believe they're real, her mother probed. Allie squirmed uncomfortably. No, but some things I just know. The basic facts are obvious to anybody with eyes. You've always been mighty observant, Allie Cat, her father said with a smile. Just so you keep the facts separate from the theory, said her mother. I know the difference, Mom, said Allie. Maybe you need to explain it to Karen and Pam, said her mother. Maybe, said Allie doubtfully. I'll try. It sounded like a good idea. But how did you explain something to people who didn't even want to talk to you? Her parents left the room, her father patting her shoulder reassuringly, her mother quickly kissing her cheek. Allie sat where she was inside, feeling her excitement over the new desk slowly leaking away. She looked at Michael, who was sitting on his knees on the desk chair, leaning over his coloring. He carefully folded his paper in half and handed it to Allie. Here, he said, I made it for you. Allie opened the page and saw that Michael had drawn two figures. One was obviously a girl with straight brown hair like Allie's and a big red smile. The other was a boy wearing Michael's favorite X-Man shirt. The two figures were about the same size and seemed to be holding hands. That's you, said Michael, pointing to the paper. And that's me, except it's when I'm grown up and I'm 11 too. Allie smiled. She didn't tell Michael that when he was 11 years old, she would be 18. Hard as that was to imagine. So she's a lot older than him. Michael continued his explanation of the picture. See, we're friends. He looked at Allie very seriously. And I never, ever call you a liar. Allie felt tears spring to her eyes. She grabbed Michael in a fierce beer hug so he wouldn't think it was his picture that made her sad. Thanks, Mikey, she whispered in his ear. She breathed in his little boy smell, a combination of no more tear shampoo and some peanut butter that she saw was stuck in his hair. I love it. It's going right here, she said, and taped the picture on the wall over her desk. Mr. Nichols put his head in the door to tell Michael it was time to get ready for bed, and Allie sat down on the desk to think.
It was clear that she saw and heard things that others didn't. Like the face of the girl with curly black hair. Like the voice of the girl saying, help me. Her parents tried to understand, but they didn't really get it. How could she tell them now that she was pretty sure she was being visited by a ghost? <laughs>